Thank you. Uh, I first like to thank the Abel Committee and the Abel Board to invite me to give this lecture on Karen Ullenbach's work. Uh, I've, it's also an honor and uh, I'm very happy to be here to celebrate uh, Karen receiving the Abel Prize. I first met Karen Ullenbach at 1977, so a lot of young people uh, think we really knew each other for more than 40 years. And then we spent one year, 79, 80, 79, 90, 79, 80, at the Institute for Advanced Study in a special program in differential geometry. And at that year, actually, the next speaker, Robert Bryan, also there. So we, we really are old friends. So for young people, mathematics is a very good subject to go in. You make very good friends and have very interesting life because you do what you really like to do and they pay for us. So we have a living and that's a very unusual profession. Um, So Karen is a very, you probably can see from that uh, video short, I like that film. It really shows what sh the character of her. She's very gentle and generous, and I'm very, very lucky to be her close friends, and also we have many happy collaborations. And her research covers several research topics in ge uh, differential geometry, mathematical physics, and partial differential equations. As you will hear one talk, the last one will be by Matt. He will talk about minimal surface, and uh, uh, Robert Bryan will talk about the calculus of variations when seems doesn't work, and how Karen find the method to make it uh, make sense of it, and then see what happens at the singular uh, points. But my, uh, my talk will be on another aspect of her work, which is the solitons and the uh, integral system. So, the, so, so let me, oh no, yeah, so the outline of the lecture is like Karen's, I have six parts, each section, uh, I hope I can get to the, 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 to the end. The last one is just a, a couple of minutes. So first I will talk about the history of uh, solar times, which is uh, the KDV and the uh, motions of uh, water waves. And the second one is uh, optic fiber and nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And the third one is uh, pseudosphere, uh, which is a curvature equal to constant minus one surfaces in three space. And uh, the equation that governs the surface is also a soliton equation, which is the sine Gordon equation. And then the fourth part, I would like to give a brief introduction how to construct soliton equations. And then the fifth part, I would like to be able to explain some of uh, Karen's work on solitons and the integrable system. And uh, the last uh, couple of minutes, I will talk a little bit about the women's program. So uh, first I talk about history of solitons. Uh, in, in mathematics and physics, a uh, soliton is a solitary wave. So it's like a pulse and uh, it travels at constant speed and doesn't change shape and has no dispersion. So in 1834, uh, Scott Russell, <coughs> he discovered the, he, what he called the wave of translation, and this gives the birth of uh, solitons. So uh, Scott Russell, in 1834, he was uh, on a horse and uh, observing a bow wave after a boat stopped and then made a wave. And what he found is this wave travels, it's a big wave, 30 foot long, one foot high, and travels at eight miles per hour. What surprised him is that the wave doesn't change shape, which is against all kind of a theory at the time. So, but he found this uh, very strange, so he actually did experiment. 
in his, uh, I read on the web that he did an experiment in water tank, he devised himself, and then he find that this does exist in the shallow water, this is in a canal, and uh, he called it a wave of translation, but at the time, no one really believed this because this shouldn't happen according to the theory of the water waves. So it take another 36 years, or maybe sh let me show you, I, I did. So it's moving, yeah. So that's what he sees, a taller wave, so that's what we say. It didn't change shape and the constant speed and it moves. But this takes a long time to, for mathematicians, an experiment is not enough. So we would like to find a differential equation that governs the motion of the waves in shallow water. So it's uh, in 1971, 36 years later, and independently by uh, Bus, Bus, Bus Nesk in 19, 87, 1871 and Rayleigh in 1876, they wrote down an equation to model what uh, they think uh, is uh, the motion of water in shallow water. So the equation is uh, a Q, which is a function of x, the position and time, and it's a real function, such that partial Q, partial T, so the rate of change of Q with respect to T should be equal to Q third derivative of x minus six Q times Q x. If this equation without, uh, it's just this part, that, that's a linear equation, it's the area equation, which is a contemporary of uh, uh, of Scott Russell, and the area didn't believe this phenomenon exists. But this one, you add this quadratic term, uh, this uh, nonlinear term, and uh, that's the, these two, Mathematician, they think this should model the waves in shallow channels. And it took another many years that uh, in 1895, Kodrovig and De Ries, they think, okay, if this, that, that equation was forgotten for many years, you can see. And then they try to see if you have a solitary wave solution, there should be a function f of x minus ct. And then you plug in that to the, to the equation, Q equal to F of X minus CT. You plug in there, then simple calculus tells us that F should satisfy an ordinary differential equation. And the Kate Cotterie and Doris was able to solve it explicitly. So what they found out is for each constant C, they find a solution. And this solution is given by second hyperbolic function, so it's, uh, the denominator is exponential, so it's decay at infinity, it's like a pulse, like a pulse which I showed before. Ah, so now uh, I just want to take one, uh, a few seconds to say that uh, I will show quite a few graphics, which is uh, the move solitary waves and also surface, surface that uh, gives you solitons. And these are produced by Palais, Richard Palais' 3D Explore Math program. This is a program which is a free software, and uh, it's a 3D Explore Math.org. You, if you have a Macintosh, you are welcome to download. It has material for undergraduate, grad, uh, so, uh, college student, high school student, also for researchers. And you may also visit his visual uh, 3D math visualization math program which is beautiful, and this, this piece of beautiful five uh, surfaces look like a glass, was produced by the artist uh, Luc Bernard and the Palais, used his program, and then beautify it, so make like a glass. So now I show the, once this is a solution given by the uh, KDV's uh, calculation, so that's the, we call the one soliton, you have a one bump and then it's moving constant speed. And it takes another many years, to 1965, actually a little bit earlier in the 50s, uh, Fermi Pasteur Oolong physicists, they, st they study a lattice model, which is an elastic string of N, I think they did 64, connected springs, and, uh, but they assume the end fixed, and the lab only neighboring springs 
interact, and that's by a quadratic force. And their study, when you have many, many strings, then it becomes almost like a continuous model. What they see is they see solitary waves interact. So that kind of inspired, in 65, Tsabuski, Kuskal, they did a numerical calculation. So at this time, you can do some computer work already. And they, they actually show that the Fermi pasta Oolong's limit, your n goes to very big, then become a continuous model, and that's it's the KDV. And they use the computer method, the numer numerical method, to try to solve the differential equation. Remember, the differential equation uh, is this one, right? We don't really have good method to solve nonlinear equation like that. But what they want to see is if I say I start with the initial data, qx time at zero is just a cosine wave. And then if I let it go according to this equation, numerically, what you will see. And that's what they found. Not this one. OK, so this is the end result. But you see, that's start with a cosine wave, and then it's split up with many parts. It's, I count maybe eight. And this is periodic. It comes back. But I cannot, we cannot show in a circle, so it just comes back. So that's the, that makes mathematicians really excited, because you have a nonlinear equation, but have some kind of composition, uh, super, superposition there. So that's really the modern study start from this numerical computation. But this is not rigorous, so people want to see, can you really solve the initial value problem for KDV with any initial data? And uh, that, uh, to explain that work, I have to go back to 51, 1951, which is uh, the so-called inverse scattering transform. This work was done by Gelfang Levitan and then independently by Machenko. What they did is they study uh, the second order, second order operator, uh, ordinary differential operator. So the given a function, u is given, and then you apply LU to a function f is minus f double prime, the two derivative plus u times f. And what they did is uh, uh, they find if you, you or oh, also I should say u is not arbitrary, u is a very smooth function, but at infinity and minus infinity, they decay very rapidly. And uh, what happens is now if you input at a negative infinity, looks like just like minus dx square, you study its eigenvalue problem, and then you look at what it happened for this solution at plus infinity, and you write down in the fundamental solution, they have two data that we call scattering data. And the amazing thing what uh, in this transform is uh, these three people they found is if you know the scattering data, you can recover the given function u that we call the potential function. So this is a, a ODE theory, but it's a very amazing theory. And uh, in, so this is what uh, Gardner, Green, Kuskal, and Mura at 1967, they used the inverse scattering transform to solve the KDV equation. So the, the way they solve it is first they show that uh, if you have a solution of the KDV, so for each t, now you have a function of one variable, qxt, and you use that as your potential of your Liouville operator, and they show that the scattering data of that family of operator depend on t. They, are, they satisfy linear equation, and they can solve that linear equation. So now you're given any initial data, say q0 of one variable, but then you f first find out its scattering data at zero, t equal, time equal to zero, but because they satisfy linear equation, they know how to solve it. So they write down its scattering data at t level, but then use the inverse scattering transform, you can recover the q at t level, and that is a solution of KDV. So this work was really uh, sh very shocking to mathematicians. And at this point, people really think this equation has so many constant of motions, because you see the eigenvalues are constant of motions, and it's just really amazing, and uh, if you, know a little bit about mechanics. I think Karen touched the uh, 
Lagrangian mechanics, Newton's, Newton's mechanics, but there's also uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. And so people are thinking this probably is a very good model for infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. But this is a, this really the start of modern study of uh, soliton equations. So now maybe I show you another movie which we use the Gaussian function exponential minus, uh, minus x squared. So it's decay rapidly at uh, plus minus infinity. And this one, this initial data break into three solitons. So each, each one you get is a different one, uh, different number of solitons. And then maybe I want to show you how this another very amazing phenomenon for soliton equations is we already see one soliton is just a bump. We also see that a soliton with a high, higher, taller soliton moves faster. So this movie will show you that if I have two soliton, one in the front, which is smaller, and then a, a one coming from the back, it's taller, but the taller one moves faster, so they interact. Look, they are not adding. In the middle, they look different. But then they separate out. When they separate out, they keep the shape, but with a phase shift, as if they didn't interact. So that is very predictable. And this solution is explicit. It's not a numerical computation. So that's, that's also make people very exciting. You can, for nonlinear equation, you can write down so many explicit solutions. And I would like to uh, mention uh, Peter Lax, who received the 205 Arbor Prize, and he is one of the, he did some really fundamental work in this uh, soliton study. He realized that all this strange phenomenon, he can write the equation, soliton equation, as what we call now Lax equation. So let me ex uh, just give a very brief explanation. So Lax equation is of the form so you can think LT, I say it's operator. LT can be an N by N matrices. So depend on T. And then B is defined by LT. And then if uh, you write down LT equal to BL minus LB, this equation now we call Lux equation. The nice thing about this is uh, you calculate directly, you will see that if LT satisfies such equation, then its eigenvalues are independent of the time. And that's what happened in the uh, KDV equation. So for KDV equation, Lux write down two operators. So LT equal to minus dx squared plus Q and BT. So you fix, you fix T, oh sorry, I did it wrong. You fix T, you write down this Liouville operator, and then you write BT in terms of the Q here. And uh, you write down this equation, and what you get is QT equal to QXXX minus 6QQX. So it's a very strange, but this explains a lot why it has constant, uh, the, why the eigenvalues are independent of time. So as I say that uh, uh, one of the reasons people are very excited is uh, even in finite dimensional, it's very difficult to find a complete integrable Hamiltonian system. That means you can really integrate to find the solutions of the whole system. So the famous example in the, in the 19th century, or even from 18th century, the, the tops, the three dimension, the tops, the motion of tops is a Hamiltonian system, and only few tops at the 19th century, 17th century, Euler tops, Kovalevsky tops, that are integrable. So it's always a challenge to see how to find in the Hamiltonian system that really you can solve it by, we say, by integration. And so in the classical mechanics, another way to say it is they exist action angle variables. So they have infinite meaning commuting integrals, and then the scattering data is their angle variables. And what I wanted to say, we will say this thing about flow a lot. And I think Karen mentioned infinite dimension manifold. So here we can think uh, like uh, the, I can write here. You, you take the map, S1 goes to R. So you take such maps. 
Oh, sorry. So you you take the functions, uh, smooth functions from S1 to R. That is your infinite dimension manifold. And then you start with like we have uh, the cosine function, and we let it follow the uh, KDV. And we call, so this is your Q0, and this is why I solve Q at T level. And we call this a flow. So when I say two flows commute, means I have one equation, which is an evolution. And then say I follow by T1 time. Say this is my KDV. And I follow another equation by T2 time. This is another equation. If we say they commute, it means that if I go T1 time and T2 time with the second equation, it's the same as I go T2 time by this equation and then follow by T1 time. So that's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, so this we say they commute. So what this study, can I get back? The study says that the KDV is not a single equation. You have infinite many commuting integrals. Each integral gives you, Hamiltonians, give you a flow. So for example, the first one is Q dQ dt equal to dQ dx, which is just translation flow. And the third one is the KDV. And then you have the fifth one, which is the fifth order nonlinear PDE, and so on. So now become a hierarchy. It's a sequence of commuting evolution nonlinear wave equations. So we usually not only one, each soliton equation comes with a whole hierarchy. Um, the, so now I, uh, that was kind of the brief introduction of KDV. The next one I want to talk about is uh, uh, optical fiber and the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So uh, optical fiber is a flexible transparent fiber made by drawing glass or plastic to a diameter just a little bit thinner than the, thicker than the hair. And fiber, fi fiber optic is uh, uh, used in current modern communications. That's made our internet fast. And in 1973, Hasegawa of AT&T Labs was the first one who suggests that maybe solitons does exist in the optical fibers. I'm not an expert on this, so this I got from the web. <laughs> but the nonlinear Schrodinger equation uh, is the mathematical model equation that models the evolution of envelope of the waves travel in optical fibers. And uh, it is this envelope that carries the digital data. And in mathematics already found out in 1971. You see, 67 was the, we find out that KDV is a completely integrable Hamiltonian system, has solid tons and so on. And then the second one found has that property is in 71. Zarkov, Shaba, they found out they can use uh, another inverse scattering transform to solve the Cauchy problem of nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And then with the simple, quite simple scattering data, they could construct explicit soliton solutions. So that uh, is the second one. And now I come to the third, oh no, I'm showing, uh, I'm showing uh, one soliton of nonlinear Schrodinger is an explicit solution. But this time, if you go back, you see the equation Q is complex valued. Qxt has a, is called Q1 xt plus Q2, i times Q2 xt. So if I want to draw the wave, I have a x variable, and the yz variable will be my uh, Q1 and Q2, the real and the imaginary power of Q. So for this, if I want to show you the wave, it would be a space curve. And I, we, draw the, we draw the x axis in this direction, like in this direction. And uh, now I'm going to show you what one soliton looks like in here. So it's, uh, it's like do it doing this, but they don't change the shape either. Constant speed. And uh, as in the KDV, we can compute two solitons explicit, explicitly too. So in this case, we have one one soliton from one direction, one from the other, they interact wildly, but when they separate, they keep the shape. So that is really quite amazing. 
So we too found, at that time at 71, we found two equations of this pro have these ama amazing properties. But then in 70s, the people in soliton theory, they found out, uh, actually I think it's uh, mater materials physics science, they find out, uh, they studied, uh, I think, a lattice model, which give you sine Gordon. But uh, then some people find sine Gordon actually occur in 19th century differential geometry. So I'm going to switch the third history, the third equation of a solid time equation. But this time is a surface in three space, which has Gaussian curvature minus one. Maybe you haven't heard Gaussian curvature. Some of you may not heard of the first time. I will try to go slow, explain what's curvature. It's actually a very intuitive uh, definition. Uh, so if we have a curve in the plane, then we, we say the straight line has curvature zero everywhere. And the circle of radius r has curvature one over r. This makes sense because if I have a circle of radius one and the circle of radius two, locally you see radius two is less curvy. So you say it's one half of your radius. And uh, then now if you have an arbitrary curve, arbitrary curve like this, oh, oh sorry, you are. If you have arbitrary curve like this, so I orient it this way, going down. Then I can use right, so if I orient down this way, then my tangent is this direction. I use right hand rule, I got a normal. And that's important for my sign, because now then I look, at, yeah, sorry. Then I look at the best circle, approximate the curve locally at this point. If this circle has radius r, we say, at this point, the curve has curvature 1 over r. But if, say, at this point, then my normal direction, remember, tangent is this way, right-hand rule will give you normal is point that way. But you are also calling the best circle approaching to it is in the opposite side. So we define the curvature to be negative 1 over r. So it's really a very intuitive definition. So curvature basically tells you the deviation of the curve in a straight line. So now I show you two, two curves. So the right-hand side, this one, curvature is t squared. So it's always, you remember, when t is big, this is very big. So it will be very tight, like a circle. But it's not a circle. And this one is also go this way. But if you have a t, if it's t, then when t is negative, the curvature, like the other curve, should go the other way and it's still very tight. So this just, I want to give you a little bit feeling of curvature of a plane curve. And then the next thing, uh, I want to be able to define Gaussian curvature. To define that, uh, I draw a picture which is a torus, so it's like the surface of a donut, and uh, to, I need to define some function called pi p. So I chose an arbitrary point, I forgot to write the p here, and I take a tangent direction u, and a normal direction to the surface, to the tangent plane. So now I use these two vectors, make a plane, and it intersect with the torus with a curve. And this curve is a plane curve. So we already see how to compute curvature of the plane curve at that point. And that value we define to be the pi p of that unit direction, of the unit tangent direction. Then we take the maximum and the minimum value of the pi p, which is al along all the unit directions. So you have a one parameter, a circle of directions. And that's called the Gaussian curvature. And Gaussian curvature turns out to be uh, we call intrinsic. It doesn't depend on how you embed something. So in this talk, I need uh, the curvature function to be negative constant. So when negative, curvature is negative, then this pi p, they go from pos maximum is positive, minimum is negative, so you go through two zero directions. These two directions we call asymptotic directions. And then we have uh, some, if you look, if you just think about the, uh, sorry, if you think about the definition on the sphere, no matter how you do the normal vector, you cut it, you got a gray circle, 
they have the same curvature. So maximum and minimum are the same, 1 over r. Therefore, the Gaussian curvature of a sphere of radius r is 1 over r squared. But maybe surprising to some people just heard the definition, for this cylinder, if you take a, a line, if you take a, a go, go down like this, go cut it this way, you get a straight line. And we know straight line has curvature zero, but if you cut this way, you get a curve which has positive curvature. Therefore, the minimum is zero, so the product of maximum and minimum is zero. So this one has zero Gaussian curvature. But another interesting fact, why I say it's intrinsic, is because, you see, if I cut this along this line, any of the line, I can open it without bending, and they become a plane. So plane, of course, has zero curvature, because no matter how we do the plane section, we get a straight line. So that's what it means. It means if you have a k equal to zero surface, then you can always kind of un unbend it. You, you don't need to change the shape or the angle or the distance, and that we call isometric. For this hyperboloid, then it has negative function as a Gaussian curvature. Go back to the torus, then you see when you go down like this, this one, this line has zero curvature, but inside is negative curvature, it's like saddle, outside is positive curvature. So most surface has a Gaussian curvature is a variable as a function. And then now we go back to 19th century. Uh, Bohr was the first one who, who realized that if you have a curvature equal to minus one everywhere, then they can, he can find a coordinate X, no, parameter of the surface so that the tangent vector fx and F, ft are unit asymptotic directions and the angle between the two asymptotic directions must satisfy sine Gordon equation, which is qxt derivative equal to sine phi. And um, moreover, AV surface of minus one curvature solution locally arise from a solution of sine Gordon. Therefore, to study this geometric subject, how, what are the surfaces in, K, K in R3, which has Gaussian curvature minus one, become the study of a solution of the sine Gordon. And then the next couple, the next three, next three uh, slides, I like to talk about Backlund theorem, which is uh, you have a map between two surfaces in R three, and then you have a constant theta, and the map satisfies the property that you join P and uh, the image P star. They should be tangent to both surfaces. And you also want the PP star has a fixed distance, sine theta. And the normal vector at the P and P star from M and M star should make a fixed angle theta. It's a very strange condition. But this is what uh, the 19th century, a big study of uh, uh, surface theory. They want to see if you have a two parameter family of uh, straight lines, you have two surfaces which tangent to all these lines, and that you put some special conditions, and then you want to see what you can say about these two surfaces. And what Backlund can say is that both M and M star should have k equal to minus one, because so far I haven't given you a single example which has k equal to minus one. But this theorem has the analytic part too, means if uh, each one gives you a sine Gordon solution, so these two solutions are related by a first order system, the first order system, and then also if you're given a solution Q, this system for each parameter S, you can solve it and get a new solution of sine Gordon. So this, is a, this actually was very instrumental for the solar time theory when in 1970s people found out sine Gordon has this transform, then people tried to find for KDV for nonlinear Schrodinger. And then there's one more result, which was um, very uh, strange too, is that if you start with uh, one solution Q0, and uh, the previous slide says you can get a whole family of solutions, but then Bianchi says 
you can, if you, if you don't have Bianchi, then you solve another, each one you solve another first order system, you get another bunch. But what Bianchi says, you don't need to do any more work by solving differential equations. This solution is obtained by algebraic formula. So that tells you this nonlinear equation seems to have a way to add algebraically. And that's another phenomenon tells you there must be a lot of symmetry for these equations. So now if we apply Q equal to zero, then it's a solution. You that equation can be solved. This equation can be solved explicitly when you have Q equal to zero. And what you get is this one parameter family of solutions. And this are the one soliton solutions for sine Gordon. But then they also have the surface corresponding to these solutions. Then you can apply Bianchi formula to get uh, two solitons and so on. So the next few slides, I want to show you some, give you a relief, some pictures. <laughs> so this is a one soliton of sine Gordon, but it's, you take the derivative, time derivative of uh, Q. So it's just not surprising you just have a pulse which moves constant speed. And this is the surface with curvature k equal to minus 1. This is for s, the parameter s is not equal to 1. But if you change the parameter s, you get a different surface. And the different surface, so when close up, you see there's a cusp in singularity. When it close up, it's the pseudosphere. And that's a solution for sine Gordon is stationary. So that's the one soliton. You have a whole family of, uh, and this surface, if you look locally, like, like I say, the cylinder, you can bend it down without stretching, and they are all locally isometric. And then two soliton, is, this time is one we call kink, one we call anti-kink, and they interact. Maybe I play like that. Oh, this is uh, one of the, you have two parameter family of uh, surface that given by two soliton solutions, so we give one here. But then there's another amazing fact is that the Bianchi formula, our parameter x1, x2 has to be real. But if we use conjugate complex number, the solution becomes good solution and is a solution. And those we call breather because they are periodic in time, so it's like a breathing machine. So you see this? This is a breather, two soliton, but it's periodic in time. And this we call breather solution. So for each theta, EI theta, you get a, a breather solution. And the surface, they are very unpredictable. They are really beautiful. So you get one of this. I only show you two. And then this is another one. I think one is, is point A, one is point six. And then this one is uh, you apply a background transformation to a breather surface, you get this one. So you, with the computer, you can generate many, many k equal to minus one surface. But you see, they always have uh, singularities. This means they are not smooth there, it's cusp. Ah, I think I'm out of time. What time I have until? Oh, oh. So maybe I go fast. <laughs> Uh, so, now I want to say how you construct new soliton equations. And the, the, maybe first actually is uh, uh, Coxon and uh, Adler, they did for finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, when it's completely integrable, they find out that uh, algebra plays an important role. And then 74, Ablowitz, Cobb, Neuro, Seagal, they find out all these first few, first four soliton equations can fit into a Lux equation of this type. And we call this Lux pair. So it means they, uh, it's, it's the A, Q, lambda, it's A depend on Q and the derivative of Q, and it's a two by two valued. And lambda is a parameter, and this we call Lux pair. And the, in 74, Zakharov Shabbat say, okay, we don't need a, two by two, we can use n by n, or any, and in this case, they construct like three wave, n wave equation, many more soliton equations. And then, but those are uh, more like uh, 
Schrodinger type. And then Drinfer Sokolov give a general method to construct KDV soliton hierarchies from algebra of loops in a simple algebra. So th those are the key development. And all this probably also motivated by early work by uh, Adler, who found KDV can be obtained from the Lie, Lie algebra of pseudo differential operators on the line. So now I have a few minutes to talk about Ullenbeck's work on integrable system and soliton equations. So in geometry, we say, oh, integrable system is a, a geometric PDE that can be written in lux pair form. So it means you have a lux pair with a parameter. And, but then, of course, you want to have similar properties. And then the integrable system need not to be wave equation anymore, can be elliptic equation. For example, the equation for harmonic maps, which Wollenbeck did a lot of work on it, and constant mean curvature surface in three space, these are nonlinear elliptic systems, but they are integrable, means they have a lux pair and they have many similar properties. So use techniques in soliton theory to study local geometry problem, it's going back to the 70s, but not so successful in global problem. So Ullenbeck's work in 89, he used loop group factorization, and he can construct all the solutions from harmonic mass from S2 to UN. That's really first time was so successful and so beautiful, and many, so many people start to use this to study constant mean curvature surface and many geometric problems. And so it's a really a new direction in differential geometry. Then maybe I... Uh, just summarize the, the previous the method. Uh, so in the formulation Karen and I have is that we the lot most of the equation can be constructed from a group of loops. And then also the group of loops can be written as a product of a positive subgroup and a negative subgroup. And then you also have to have a commuting sequence of uh, elements in the positive Lie algebra. And uh, Maybe I just say that we want to find the symmetries, how this, uh, why you can solve inverse scattering problem, why you can have this superposition. This all say there's a symmetry, but the symmetry is a big group. So the group for this infinite dimensional problem is a loop group, and it's the factorization of the loop group because they are not. A, commutative. So if you have F plus in the positive group, F minus in the negative group, when you want to write into a negative group plus a positive group, they won't be the same. And that defines, we call, we get a symmetry of the positive group acting on the negative group, negative group acting on the positive group. But basically, it comes back to this factorization problem. And we, our joint work was trying to use the loop group distressing action to explain geometrically how all this remarkable property comes. So really, is we try to understand what's the ge geometry behind it, what's the symmetry behind it. So we find out the GS flow equation in the soliton hierarchy is generated by that J, J, the generators. And then we also, the very complicated inverse scattering transform method, we can use loop group factorization to get a, usually a local solution. But if our soliton equation comes from loop group, from a compact Lie group, then our solution is global. And then also we find backland transformation is really belong to a much bigger symmetry, it's the L minus group symmetry, but uh, backland transformation comes from the simplest element in the negative group, so which is a rational loop. And the Bianchi formula comes from the fact that the negative group acting is an action, so you have the group loss. Uh, then we, we worked for many years together, so like Schrodinger flow and on the symmetry space, sigma models, space-time multiple equation, these are also integrable system, and we get we use the techniques to study this equation. And uh, sorry, I. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, this one. Is we we didn't get a really satisfactory. Uh, 
work, but we are fascinated by it, and we try to understand. So tau function was a very strange subject, and the Sato defined for KP hierarchy in 83, and since then there are many new definitions and uh, applications in very strange place, like in random matrix theory, algebraic geometry, uh, so in combinatorics. But uh, 1991, the most thing that we really surprised is Witten conjecture that the partition function of quantum cohomology of a point is a, fun is a tau function of the KDV hierarchy, and uh, that tau function is the fixed point, unique fixed point of the so-called Virasoro action. So we didn't know how, we, we could explain many the other fact properties we have, but we couldn't explain this. But then we find out, we still cannot, but we, had a, we made some progress, small progress, that we use Wilson's definition of tau function, we give an integrable form, integral formula to calculate the second partials of the log of the tau function. The tau function is defined for each element in the negative group. But then there's also a famous theorem that says if you take a tau function and take log and you take two x derivatives, you get a solution of a KDV if you do the tau function for KDV. So we, we can prove that uh, all the uh, dreamfer sokolovs KDV type of solution, we can recover solution from the second derivative. But what we find is is that if you have NSL, uh, non in a Schrodinger type, then this fact fails. It only recovers the solution up to a uh, finite dimensional action. And the, also, the Virasoro action is a very strange action to us, but we find a very simple geometric way to construct the action and then to compute, use the formula we have for log to compute the, uh, the infinitesimal action. That's the Viosora action. Uh, so now this is the, sorry, the last part, which should be important, but uh, I was rushing through it. And uh, now maybe a little bit lighter subject, but I think it's important too. So Karen is a, we all know she's a very fantastic, outstanding mathematician, but she really cares about encouraging women to continue careers in mathematics. So in 94, she started, uh, uh, she was asked by Institute for Advanced Study to organize a woman and the mathematics program at IAS. So we, I mean, she, she asked and she asked me to help because I'm a good friend. And uh, we ran the program for many years. And I left the position in 2011, and Karen stayed until 2013. So this currently, the program is run by Alice Chen, uh, Dusa McDuff, and uh, Margaret Reedy. So Karen now lives in uh, Princeton, so she's still involved and helped the program. program. Uh, so now I come to my last slides. Uh, no, not the last second. So this program, Women's and Mathematics, program run by IAS, uh, got the 2019 American Math Society Mathematics Program that make a difference award in April this year. And this is a group photo that taken in IAS last year when we have a 25 years uh, celebration of the program. And uh, uh, all the current, I think maybe I should say, you see this is Alice Chen, that's uh, the current one, uh, uh, Macduff, and this is Reedy. And Karen is behind because they put short people in front, so I'm in front. <laughs> and uh, this is Christina and Lancy Hinston, and... Uh, 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 <laughs> I'm tongue-tied, sorry. And this is, she helped us with the program. So, now come to my last stop, uh, last... This is the photo I took for Karen when she gave a lecture two weeks ago at a Yao's conference in Harvard. And uh, so congratulations to Karen and thanks for your attention. <laughs>